Good day everyone! Welcome to the continuation of our discussion about the period of colonization and revolution, Declaration of Independence. For the continuation of our lesson, first, we will discuss Thomas Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence. Who's Thomas Jefferson? A plantation owner and a lawyer. Thomas Jefferson was a delegate from Virginia to the Second Continental Congress. After Richard Henry Lee called for independence in June of 1776, Thomas Jefferson was appointed to a committee to draft the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson is known as the author of the Declaration of Independence, although his draft was heavily edited by the delegates of the Second Continental Congress. Thomas Jefferson continued as an important figure in early American politics by serving as diplomat to France, Secretary of State, and as the third President of the United States. For you to better understand what is the Declaration of Independence all about, let me present to you the short video taken from YouTube. Sit back and relax as you watch the video that I will present. The year is 1776. Tensions had been rising in the American colonies for years, and emotions were at a tipping point. The Second Continental Congress was already in session in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, when the cries for independence grew too fierce to ignore. The time had come to formally separate from Great Britain. On June 11, 1776, a committee of five men were chosen to draft the ultimate breakup letter. John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Roger Sherman, Thomas Jefferson, and Robert Livingston. Over the course of 17 days, a document was penned that would impact the lives of generations of people the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson was the leader of the committee and was the main author of the Declaration of Independence. He organized the document into different parts. The Preamble, the Declaration of Natural Rights, the List of Grievances, and the Resolution of Independence. The preamble was the introduction to the document, and Jefferson didn't mince words. It says, When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. In the words of a modern breakup letter, Great Britain, we're breaking up with you and you're about to find out why. The next section is referred to as the Declaration of Natural Rights. In words that have been immortalized in the minds of generations of people, this section explains that every citizen is born with certain rights that should never be taken away. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It goes on to state that the power of government comes from the people, and if the government abuses the rights of the people, they have a right to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. By this point in the document, if it wasn't yet clear to Great Britain why America was separating from them, the colonists were about to bring their receipts. Thomas Jefferson really spilled the tea in the list of grievances, where he set out to list all the complaints that the colonists had against King George III. What were the complaints, you ask? Let's take a peek. Yeah, he did that. And that. And he definitely did that. Oh yeah, that's a bad one. 
been worse. Oh yeah, there was a lot. In the final section of the Declaration of Independence, the colonists solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and have right to be free and independent states. With those words, the American colonists had charted a new path towards freedom. On July 4, 1776, the Declaration of Independence was officially adopted by the Second Continental Congress and a new nation was born. I hope you enjoyed the video I just presented, and now that we are done watching it, we may now proceed to our discussion. What's up with the title? The title Declaration of Independence is a combination of a title and a statement of fact. The actual document doesn't have a formal title but it does mention that it's a declaration in the subheading. The text is literally a declaration of independence, though and we only have one of those. So pretty soon it got capitalized to become the declaration of independence. Number two, what's up with the opening lines? When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitled them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind should also require a shorter opening sentence. This opening paragraph famously talks about what people should do when they have to break away and start their own nation. Generally speaking, of course, we haven't gotten to America yet. Jefferson just says that those people breaking away, whoever they may be, should explain themselves, implying that he will do just that in the following paragraphs. Jefferson sets the stage for the rest of the declaration by equating the action of these colonies declaring independence with a more grandiose human ideal. The American Revolution is within the course of human events. It's not just a weird French group asking for something ridiculous. They are in fact part of a noble tradition. And they are following the proper course of action through this very document. The next paragraph contains a lot of philosophical ideas about what humans deserve and their role in government. So. The first sentence sets up the ideological discussion by instantly making the declaration into a meditation on humanity. Jefferson begins with the vaguest, broadest idea and then gets steadily more specific until finally we get the particular facts. By the time the reader gets to the nitty-gritty evidence, he or she has already been given the tools to see the colonist's ideological perspective. What's up with the closing lines? We, therefore the representatives of the United States of America, in general congress, assembled appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions do in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states that they are absolved from all the allegiance to the british crown and that all political connection between them and the state of great britain is and ought to be totally dissolved and that as free and independent states, they have full power to live war, conclude peace, contract alliances, 
establish commerce and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. The closing paragraph of the Declaration of Independence is probably the driest because it's the business part where he actually gets around to, you know, declaring independence. In a couple of sentences, Jefferson says that all ties with Britain are gone. The United States is independent and it can do all the things that free countries do. The sentences are long and kind of wordy, as most official government documents are because he has to be sure that the statement covers all bases and doesn't leave any loopholes or room for doubt. It's 18th century legalist. Jefferson does throw some elegance in at the final line, where he says, And for the support of this declaration, with the firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Not only in this a nicer way to end than a list of all other acts and things which independent states may of right do, but it gives a sense of camaraderie and unity that is not only inspirational, but again justifies the nation's bid for independence by portraying it as a real united country. Meter. The Declaration of Independence is only one parchment long, much of which is just signatures. John Hancock alone takes up like a paragraph of space. Way to be a showboat, Hancock. Yup, this massively important document is actually pretty short. Also, the few big ideas are pretty straightforward and easy to grasp. Thanks, Founding Fathers! Sure, Jefferson writes in a somewhat elevated language with long sentences, and in a bit of a fancier style than what we normally read now, and with some words in there that aren't used all that much today. It ain't good night, Moon, but it's also not Ulysses. Here are some of the trivia. First, a lucky intern recently found an incredibly valuable original draft of the colony's plea to the British people in the attic storage of a historic house in New York City. Talk about earning college credit. Second, an online poll found that Americans see the Declaration of Independence as the most influential document in American history. Which kind of makes sense, because without it, there wouldn't be American history. Well done, Americans! Third, the night of July 4, 1776, the declaration was taken to the printing shop of John Dunlap and an unknown number of copies were printed and sent out to local legislatures and military leaders, including George Washington. The first printing is known as Dunlap Roadside, and there are 26 known copies remaining in existence. This was a time before, you know, electricity was a thing, so they had to use old-fashioned methods like paper copies to spread the word. Fourth, Thomas Jefferson drew heavily from the Virginia Declaration of Rights, adopted on June 12, 1776 for the first two paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson was really into his home state of Virginia. So, how lucky for him to have such a relevant document nearby just waiting to be a source of inspiration for him. And lastly, 
Jefferson drafted the Declaration of Independence on a portable writing desk, which he suspiciously kept because, you know, the Declaration turned out pretty well. The desk is still in Monticello. Let us now move forward to discuss the Declaration of Independence themes. Questions about dissatisfaction Why were the colonists dissatisfied with the British government both legally and ethically? If you had to encompass Jefferson's statements of dissatisfaction into a single sentence, what would it say? How effective is Jefferson's depiction of colonial dissatisfaction? Does he go too far or not far enough? Or, does he capture it perfectly? Is a prominent theme of dissatisfaction necessary for a declaration of independence? Why? Jefferson's complaints about the British government distract from the primary purpose of the declaration of independence and make the document really about something else entirely. Jefferson had to elaborate heavily about the colonists' dissatisfaction with Britain in order to be taken seriously and not seen as ungrateful or hasty in their decision. Second, Freedom, Independence, and Tyranny Jefferson consistently uses the juxtaposition of freedom and tyranny throughout the Declaration of Independence. King George and Parliament represent tyranny, while the people of America represent freedom. Jefferson compares the two, sometimes directly, sometimes by implication, as a way of illustrating the colonies' justification for their declaration. Freedom also comes into play in a more literal sense, since the document serves to give the colonists legal freedom from their former rulers. More significantly, Jefferson's device of comparing the two opposing ideas emphasizes the differences between the colonies and Britain, as if to say that the colonies are independent regardless of their official status. Questions about freedom, independence, and tyranny What are Jefferson's definitions of freedom and tyranny? Would they be the same if the declaration were written today? How is the use of the contrasting themes of freedom and tyranny influenced by the events leading up to independence? Does Jefferson make a more convincing argument about the existence of freedom or tyranny? And lastly, what big picture implications could or did Jefferson's use of this theme have in the world? Was it reflected in other nations' independence movements? Although Jefferson provides many examples of the tyranny of the British, he doesn't fully explain how the United States will provide an alternative method of government. The primary reason Jefferson leans on the freedom versus tyranny theme is more rhetorical than logical. He is using juxtaposition as a device to convince people to support an independent America. 
Next, we have principles. Principles are fundamental ideas about how people should behave or how the world should operate, except in science, but that's not really what we're discussing here. In the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson discusses the reasons why the British government has acted wrongly and therefore lost the right to govern the colonies. By arguing that the colonists have certain rights as human beings, which should be protected by the government, Jefferson and the Continental Congress are proclaiming that the king and the parliament's actions have not been morally right. The founding fathers are adhering to certain principles to determine their vision of how government should be and to prove how the British government has failed. Questions about principles What effect does Jefferson's emphasis on principles have on the overall impact of the text? What seems to you to be the most important principle to Jefferson? If you were writing the Declaration of Independence, what principles would you have focused on? Would they differ from Jefferson's? Knowing what you do about the context of the Declaration of Independence, do you think the British government and the colonial governments were following different principles? If so, in what ways? If not, then why were they at war? The principle of good, benevolent government is big for Jefferson and is really the main idea of the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson provides more evidence for the lack of principles on the British side than for the presence of principles on the American side. Fourth, Legitimacy Jefferson and the Committee of Five made sure that the Declaration of Independence didn't just, you know, declare independence but gave a multitude of legitimate reasons for doing so. Jefferson also drew in some lines showing that the colonies knew what they wanted or didn't want from a government, proving that this UPT rebels understood what a government should be and therefore were capable of governing themselves. The declaration was the first official document of the United States and it had to prove that the United States had a legitimate cause and right to exist as an independent nation and should be considered an equal. Questions about legitimacy First, do you think the colonies had a legitimate claim to independence and to be recognized as an independent nation? Why or why not? Second, does Jefferson successfully give the impression of legitimacy to the case of colonial independence? And lastly, why would it be important to emphasize legitimacy in a document like the Declaration of Independence? What other documents or types of documents might benefit from this theme? Jefferson needed to prove that the colonies were a legitimate nation because otherwise the Declaration of Independence would merely be seen as part of their angsty teenage rebellion against the crown. Jefferson provides lots and lots of evidence to support the legitimacy of the colonies' argument. His effort implies that either the colonies felt that their complaints had been ignored or that they weren't confident that the British government would take their claim seriously. And lastly, for the team, we have equality. The most obvious presentation of the idea of equality in the Declaration of Independence is the part we all know and love. Hint, the word equal is in the sentence. That sentence has echoed throughout American history. We now know that the 18th century version of equality was super incomplete. But even bringing up the idea that men were born equal was relatively new 
especially in a public document. Jefferson also includes moments that show the colonists' desire to be considered equals of their fellow citizens in Britain and how that desire has been ignored in recent decades. Questions about equality First, why did Jefferson feel a need to promote the theme of equality in the Declaration of Independence? Second, does Jefferson get his message across? If you were living in England in the 1770s, would you have been convinced that the colonies were your equals? If not, what more could he have done? Third, why do you think Jefferson starts off the declaration with his major statement about equality? What effect does its placement have on the text as a whole? Lastly, how has the vision of equality that Jefferson presents been reflected or disputed throughout American history? Jefferson had to say all men were created equal, not just the colonies and the British because a grand sweeping philosophical statement is way harder to argue with. Along with that famous line about equality, the theme is in the background throughout the whole declaration, because Jefferson is accusing the British government of treating the colonies as inferior subjects. Here are the references used for this video lecture. And that's the end of our discussion about the period of colonization and revolution, Declaration of Independence. I hope you learned something from our lesson. Thank you for watching!